Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. For many of us at midlife, when we find ourselves out of relationships, we start creating new ones, but typically not with a human. Most likely, you're going to go out there and find something that's more loyal, loving, and unconditionally at your side, and that is the love affair with dogs. Today, we're going to be talking about a number of households with pet dogs that grows every year. Dog parks have come to occupy a special position in modern life, and joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today is someone who just finally became steeped being pulled away from the electronics and the texting world that most of us have become accustomed to and found himself in the dog park subculture. Joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today is author of the book Off the Leash, longtime Boston Globe TV critic Matthew Gilbert will take us on a delightful journey of what this subculture is and looks like. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today our guest, Matthew Gilbert. Matthew, thank you for joining us today. Oh, it's a pleasure to be with you, Daniel. Isn't it nice to get away from TV and have a dog that gets you out there connecting with people again without the text message, huh? That is so true. I should have named the book Off the Digital Leash. Oh, there you go. <laughs> now, tell us about how this all started for you. It was interesting because you grew up like a lot of kids where television was basically your babysitter and eventually your whole world, I mean, as you were describing you can actually recite lines from shows that you were used to watching and even movies as well. But then that all eventually changed for you. What happened? Uh, well, you know, um, as you mentioned, I'm the TV critic for the Boston Globe. Um, and uh, so I, you know, have spent a, a large chunk of my life uh, watching television. I mean, I, I watch sometimes between... 25 and 35 hours of TV a week. Um, and so, you know, I wouldn't call myself a complete loner, but I was um, definitely on the more introverted side of the end of the spectrum. And um, I fell in love uh, in my early 40s. Uh, and I fell in love, which I think opens you up to new things. And then I fell in love with a dog lover. Um, and so I found myself thrown together frequently with dogs, even though I had been terrified of them most of my life. Um, and before I knew it, I couldn't live without a dog. And so we got a dog. And before I knew it, he was pulling me to the dog park where I did not want to go. Um, and before I knew it, I was madly in love with going to the dog park with my dog. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the story, um, you know, edited down. Um, but it, it's just been a wonderful experience to sort of, you know, I, I mean, I'm I'm 56 now, but um, when I first got got my first dog um, and started going to the park, you know, I I was in my mid 40s and I thought, well, I am who I am, you know, I'm never going to change. I'm happy with who I am, but this is it. And so it's wonderful to finally so to, to, to have a change at that stage in your life, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I'm sure to some of your listeners that seems quite young. But I think when you're in your 40s, you, you think you're, you know, you think you're set in stone. You think you are who you are forever. Um, but it's always great to be reminded that new things can come into your life and, and open your eyes and pull you as my dog did, into new social experiences. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, Matthew, the thing is, the dog park itself is pretty unique because it hasn't been around for a whole long time. You know, you think back into the 1980s, you know, you could take your dog to a park, but there really wasn't a specific dog park, or there might have been some sprinkled here and there, but the dog park, I don't think, was really becoming into its own until right around the turn of the new millennium. Tell us about, you know, uh, as you discovered sort of the history of these things, how they came about. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that as more and more households um, now have dogs, um, and many of them are in the city. And uh, so you're, you're, you're really having to find a place where you can take your dog and let him off leash. I mean, we like to take good care of our dogs now. You know, we understand that uh, 
you know, back in when I was growing up, when I was a little kid, I mean, my friends who had dogs, those dogs slept sometimes in the garage and, you know, or would run off for a few days and no one really cared. I mean, now we, we really like to take good care of our dogs. So I think a lot of urban people have realized that they need to have a place to take their dog that where they can take their dog off leash, where their dog can, you know, poop. Um, and so uh, dog parks have become a thing. And, you know, in the case of Brookline, Massachusetts, which is where I am, and which is sort of right on the border of Boston, we have only multi-use parks. So the dog park is also a park where kids can come and play soccer. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's that style of dog park, whereas um, a lot of cities actually have dog, you know, dog-only parks, mm -hmm. which is fantastic. Um, but it's still a struggle. I, there are still a number of... Um, groups of people who are trying to establish dog parks in their city and coming up against a lot of um, resistance from, you know, abutters and um, just people who don't like dogs. So dog parks are certainly becoming more common, but they're not givens yet. Mm -hmm. I know living out in the Pacific Northwest, we've got quite an array of dog parks where dogs are allowed to roam free and in some cases without fences. Yeah. And even the ones with fences tend to have huge areas that the dogs could be in. And it's interesting how they've also broken them down into dog sizes. This is for the small dogs, the medium, and then the large dogs, you know. Darn and, it, why uh, is everything better out there? <laughs> why is everything better on the West Coast? Well, you know, and that wasn't my intention, but it's kind of funny you say that because mm -hmm. just recently I was uh, talking with somebody from New York, and apparently... Nobody on the West Coast can do anything as good as people in New York do it, you know. Right? So I guess we've got something on New Yorkers now. We have dog parks. But, you know, it's really fascinating because as you go into this, and I love the way you describe the culture as well as the people because you really hit it on the head, you know, that this is quite an experience beyond just thinking that you're going to take your dog to the park, set it free, and maybe socialize with other dogs, but there's more to it than that. I mean – this was an area where barriers really break down and people are really willing to connect with each other, whereas out on the street, you know, you just kind of pass by as though they don't even exist. <laughs> I know. It's, it's so true. And uh, some people have said to me, well, why is a dog park different from, say, a children's playground? Well, it's very different. Um, for one thing, you get people of all ages at a dog park. You get, you know, I find myself at 56 mingling with, you know, Boston University students as well as people in their 80s who are, you know, walking their dogs. And it, it really does change the, the, the tone of a, a social group when you've got that kind of age range. And you also have people from all different walks of life. Um, you've got people you know, who are clearly one or two steps up from homelessness. And then you've got some wealthy people who probably live in, you know, beautiful, large homes. Um, and so it, the chemistry is kind of, is, is unique. And um, the fact that you're among dogs also changes the chemistry. It, you know, the dogs are sort of running around usually, and often they're wrestling, and that kind of gives everybody around them a contact high. You know, there's a lot, I, I find that there's a lot of um, joyousness uh, at, a, at the dog park. You know, people feel the the spontaneity and the energy of the dogs, and, and it affects them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just like children in a park, only they seem to be more passive observers rather than participants. Yeah. Uh, you mean the, the owners? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, I think at a dog park, we're more actively engaged, mm -hmm. I think, in, in playing with our dogs we're not as competitive about whose dog is 
more intelligent. <laughs> right. <laughs> Whereas maybe that's the case at, at uh, playgrounds. Um, and it's just, it's a very, uh, it, people, t- I, I think because th- there's a wonderful sense of both anonymity and intimacy at a dog park, which I have not found anywhere else except maybe in group therapy. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, it's, it's um, you, you're seeing each other every day and, and sometimes more. I mean, I, I take my dog Toby to the park sometimes during the nice weather twice a day. And so I'm seeing the same people a lot, and we really share a lot about ourselves to each other. I've, I've had conversations about you know, life and death and grief and um, all kinds of big things. And yet, at the very same time, we often don't see each other outside of the park. We don't know each other's last names. We, you know, in many cases, we don't know... Uh, what kind of home the other people live in. So it's 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 a really nice anonymity and intimacy. It's like, you know, what stay what happens in the dog park stays in the dog park. Right. And uh that I find very liberating and I think other people do as well. Now I like that in some cases you broke people up into categories of taxonomy as you call it, <laughs> the species of owners and it's really fascinating first of all to realize how alike an owner and a dog look. <laughs> how alike a dog and its owner actually are in personality. <laughs> yes, exactly. You know, and I know definitely, you know, when you go near the woman that's got the wallet-sized chihuahua in the handbag, that chances are she's probably going to be just as snippy as the dog usually is. But <laughs> Exactly. It's so funny. You I know, mean, and then you get the giant whopping dog, and it's usually a gregarious owner ready to invite you over to his house for a 50-pound barbecue. You know? right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's great. I love it. I mean, occasionally you'll see um, the, the, you know, big, muscular, you know, six foot five owner, male owner, and the tiny dog, mm-hmm. and that's always an interesting contrast. You know, when 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 the dog actually is quite different from the owner, almost the opposite. Um, that's always funny too. But in most cases, you're right. Absolutely, there is a very strong uh, similarity between a dog and his his or her owner. Now, let's talk about the one that captivated your heart, a yellow lab named Toby. Yes. Um, He is my goose. He is, uh, you know, a dog who makes me laugh at least ten times a day, usually more. Um, I, you know, what what happened was when when I got Toby, uh, when we got Toby, um, It was a situation where uh, he, from day one, he was seven weeks old, and all he wanted to do was play, play with me, play with everyone he met, all the other dogs he met. And, you know, as I sort of alluded to earlier in our conversation, I was more of an introvert and um, not really a playful kind of guy. And... So it was a it was an interesting contrast. Toby and I probably look alike. You know, we're both tall and have big snouts. Um, <laughs> but uh, temperamentally, I I was a little bit thrown because you know he was so eager to play, um, and you know in that way I think there can be a, a lovely kind of balance between an owner and uh, his or her dog. Um, You know, they say that you get the dog that you need and not necessarily the dog you want. And I think that's what happened in my case, you know, where this dog kind of pushed me into becoming a more social being just because he had to have his social life. Um, You know, of course, I could have chosen not to take him to the park, but the the first two or three times I took him there, I could see that it was it was so important to him. It was so valuable. You know, he just came to, to life. And I could see his sort of nature coming out and emerging just among other dogs. So he sort of, you know, has pulled me into uh, a way of living that I, 10 years 
in, I just embrace and, and, and I'm so grateful to him for pushing me to becoming a more sort of social and playful person. Mm-hmm. Well, Labradors certainly have the energy, and God forbid you should own one in the city and not take it out. They need to run. Exactly. Mm-hmm. You know, um, unfortunately, there are people who don't quite understand that, um, which is too bad. But these days, more and more, you see people who are mm-hmm. at work all day long at least hiring a dog walker to come and, you know, take the dog out a little bit. Mm -hmm. Now, I like where you were talking about the unspoken roles and rules at the dog park uh, that are spoken and unspoken. First, of course, you see not only the bag dispensers, but now you see this whole new breed of product that you find in pet stores now, you know, the plastic bag dispensaries that look like toys or, you know, they're kind of hidden in the way they dispense the plastic bags that go out to, of course, pick up after the pooch. Yes. But the one that I was really interested in finding out a little bit more about, if you have direct experience with this, is being careful about having relationships with people or friendships (laughs) outside of the park. Yes. (laughs) Always Because, boy, they're great inside the ring, aren't they? Exactly. But like a fighter, you step outside the ring and it could be a totally different person. (laughs) Exactly. It's really fascinating um it it is you know it's like vegas i mean you know what happens in the dog park stays in the dog park and and when you really like talking to someone you you know uh, uh, of course feel tempted to kind of try to bring the friendship outside of the park and it's a tricky process it doesn't always work and if you're careless about it, you can jeopardize the special friendship that you have at the park. Um, so I have managed over the past 10 years to form a couple of very, very strong friendships outside of the park with people I met in the park. But, um, you know, I, I took each one of those friendships out of the park very slowly and carefully and I have seen it not work with you know awkward results oh yeah those people outside of the dog park and within the park what will we do (laughs) yeah you know I mean um it, it is interesting though because uh if you if you form a, a friendship with someone in the dog park, um, when something, even if you never take it out of the park, when, if something disastrous or horrible happens to you, um, those people are going to be f- there for you anyway. Um, there's a woman that I've met through the dog park, um, and she lost uh, to cancer mm-hmm. a child when he was, I think, about five. And... Um, she described to me the way that the dog park people really gathered around her. Um, they came to her house to walk her dog. They brought her food. They did not overwhelm her. They did not expect to come into the house and hang around, which is what happens when someone dies. You know, mm-hmm. um, the grieving people are sort of surrounded by loved ones. Uh, sometimes oppressively so. Um, she said the dog park people were just right, you know. Now she she said they weren't people that she was really close to, and yet they they came and uh, to her house and they really did what they could do for her. Mm-hmm. And I love that story. I love listening to her talk about it. It really is too fascinating to realize again how the dog plays this unique central role of breaking down any barriers that we create, you know, yeah. with the outside world, especially when it comes to hierarchy. You know, we tend to get really self, you know, this idea of, uh, you know, this is my job or my career and this is my status in the community so forth. But, you know, once you kind of walk in, you're with the dog, all of that really doesn't seem to matter. You might talk about it, you know, as a matter of fact, you know, sort of a second thought of a discussion, but it's not the direct discussion you typically have outside of a park. Yes. And I, I, I totally agree with you. And I, it's one of the things that I, I love about the park is um, the way that the hierarchy there is 
so much different from the hierarchy in the world at large, you know, so that uh, it doesn't matter how much money you have or how much prestige you have when you're at the dog park. All that matters really is your your love for dogs, your respect for other owners and their dogs, um, you know, uh, that kind of thing. Whether or not you can have a, a, a nice, warm conversation with someone, those are the things that, that really define who you are within the park mm-hmm. boundaries. I like the names of some of the people that you actually describe in specific groups, like the Warrior Too Muchus. Yeah, were you not enough us? <laughs> How you came to get some of those names, but it was quite interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's it is funny. I mean, there are types at the park, and you know, I I, I mean, I I I was making a little bit of fun at their expense, but of course, I'm one of them as well. Sure, um, you know, I'm I'm one of the people who probably uh, on certain days can be a worry too much us. Um, you know, if a, if a, a dog approaches my dog and I, I'm, I'm not familiar with the dog, I might be a little bit overly concerned, um, you know. I know what's fascinating, too. Uh, we own a pug. People love pugs. Yes. And the most consistent comment we get besides, God, that's the most adorable dog they've ever seen, is that <laughs> that is a big pug. You know, and 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 yeah, but I mean, very healthy looking dog. Sometimes people think that maybe he's crossed between, you know, an English bulldog. Not quite that big, but you know, he, he's a, a fair sized pug compared to most of the pugs that you see out there. And once a month, not too far from where we live, they have what they call a pug meetup, which is at a dog park. And this is where owners for an hour or two come in with their pugs. And we just all kind of get together. Not that we go all the time, but it's really interesting when you see this group of people together, especially with this breed, because this breed is known for being upbeat, happy, very friendly with people. And you see the people that own these are very much the same way, yeah. you know, always smiling and chatty. And I kind of wonder, do they have like a Labrador sort of a meetup or or anything where you see specific breeds on a specific day where owners of those breeds come together? That's very interesting. I have never been to a lab meetup, but I'm sure they exist. Okay. Um, you know, I find that there are so many labs that, you know, I stumble into accidental meetups occasionally because, mm-hmm. you know, there'll be three other labs at the park. Um, I haven't, but I can say that when I meet a lab owner, I do feel as though I have something instantly in common with them Mm -hmm. um, beyond just the fact that we own labs. Um, I'm not sure. I've never done a scientific analysis of it. Um, I don't know if one ever could, but it's, it's probably the case. I think we each are drawn to, you know, especially if we get full bred dogs, we're often drawn to them because of something. And sometimes I, I can't even articulate sometimes what it is about the lab breed mm-hmm. that speaks to me, but it does speak to me. I mean, I feel very lab-centric in mm-hmm. a way. Well, they're very playful dogs. They're, it's like a boundless seven-year-old child. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And I mean, there's, there's also just something tactile about his fur and the shape of his head. You know, I can stare at him for, and do stare at him for hours and um, I never get tired of it. So mm-hmm. it, it is funny how, how we, we do have these connections with certain breeds. And it's funny, too, how we kind of work through and live through our dogs. To give you another example, as every year in Portland, Oregon, they have what's called a pug crawl. <laughs> and, and, yeah, and each year this thing, you know, it's put on by the Humane Society. It's to help raise money is one of the things that they have a free pug crawl costume contest, and they usually theme it like this year, of course, was the idea of doing Comic-Con. So just imagine, you know, people showing up with their pugs, dressing them up in the favorite superheroes or anything to do with Comic-Con. We decided to dress ours as Tron, believe it or not. 
<laughs> and, uh, you know, you just never know what you're going to get into. But, boy, it sure is fascinating, like I said, to see this group of people. And there's several hundred people that go to this thing every year, and, I, and it's growing. I think eventually they're going to have to find a new site. It's just getting really big. And, you know, and so that's what I wondered about, what it would be like to see a group of people, for instance, with Labradors like yourself and, and what that would look like. You know, I'd find that that would be very energetic and very a lot of fun. Yes, I agree. I have seen a bulldog meetup. Oh, okay. Um, and, <laughs> you know, what we were saying earlier about how a dog and its owner can look very much alike was borne out for sure. Um, I saw a lot of, you know, roundish um, people, and it was it was really amusing and, and, and lovely. Um, you know, uh, bulldogs are, I think, funny you know they're like they're just whether they're trying to be funny or not there's something comic about bulldogs Mm -hmm. and uh to just see a whole crew of them you know 20 bulldogs kind of running around together is just mm, hard to describe it's so amusing what has it been like for people who have read your book off the leash as far as what they express to you uh about the book um you know the only complaint that I've heard from the people at the dog park is why wasn't I in it and why wasn't I in it more? <laughs> um, it's not yeah. all about the dog, you know that. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, I mean, you know, I, it really is a celebration of um, the dog park and the people I've met there. And mm-hmm. I do poke fun at them and at myself. Um, but overall, I think the tone is quite celebratory. Um so I haven't really heard any complaints. Of course, people might be grumbling behind my back, but I don't think so. Mm-hmm. Um, the only people I expect uh, not to like the book are the people I, uh, who are the villains mm-hmm. in the book, and those are the people who don't protect other dogs from their aggressive dog. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I have no stomach for that, and, um, you know, I... I very clear about that in the book. If you have an aggressive dog, you need to own that dog's issues if you're going to bring that dog in proximity of other dogs. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, we're out there stampeding against people who bully in school, but you're going to allow your dog to go in there and do that? What you exactly. thinking? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I know it's funny with ours. We go into the dog park, and he doesn't seem real interested in other dogs. You always find him just out there all by himself sniffing the perimeter. Yes, And I said, you know, honey, I think he's a lot like us because you don't find us mixing with groups a whole lot either. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. It's true. You know, and, and, and sometimes when I take Toby to the dog park, he does that too. He, he'll mm-hmm. sniff around. I mean, he's 10 now. And he'll sniff around and um, not really play. But I still think it's valuable for a dog to be off the leash and to be at least within sight of his or her people. You know, mm-hmm. his, the other dogs, the dog community. Um, I, you know, I, I think it's even if a dog is necessarily playing, the dog is benefiting. Mm-hmm. Well, Matthew, it's been a pleasure to have you on the program to share something that we have in common, which is taking dogs to a park and having a dog in the first place. And I'm sure that a lot of people will really enjoy the stories that you present here in the book and see a little bit of themselves in what you describe as well. Is there a website people can find out more about the book and how to get it? And, and Absolutely. Yes. Um, it's MatthewGilbert.com. MatthewGilbert.com. Very That's good. Right. Again, it's off the leash. and We encourage you to get that way as well and get off those cell phones and get out there and start exploring <laughs> things. And, Matthew, thank you so much for presenting this to the world for us. Oh, thank you, Daniel. It was a pleasure. You bet. Thank you again. Bye-bye. We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. Get out there and get to your favorite dog park. If you don't have a dog, get out and get a dog and get out to your favorite dog park and find a whole new way to view life. We also encourage you to visit us at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. We do have our exclusive e-news updates. We encourage you to sign up for there as well. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. You've been listening to the Beyond 50 Radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway.